Hey everybody, welcome back to C++ Programming. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about loops. So, uh, why are loops important in computer programming? It's because uh, repetition is work, we do not like it, and uh, quite frankly, you know, the things you can do with a computer, often it's because they are repetitive, right? Like, I want to take this huge database and go through every single record and I want to pull out these specific records and there could be millions of people, uh, you know, people in that database or whatever. Like the numbers can be staggering. And so being able to write a quick program to be able to go and grab that information, parse it, do something with it. Um, and that's where, that's where you get the value out of computing. Um, and so loops are going to be the way that we do repetition. Now, before we get to loops though, we're going to talk about a few useful operators when we're using loops. We could have covered this with the operators before, but, you know, it's early days at that point. So might as well introduce them as we need them. Um, and so we're going to introduce the plus plus operator. Uh, plus plus operator is actually really, you know, I almost want to say central just because it's how C++ gets its name, right? Uh, C++ is based on a language called C. Plus plus is the increment operator. It adds one to a number. So C plus plus is just C incremented by one, right? Um, there is no C plus. It's just C and C plus um, plus. So here's the idea. If you have a variable, let's say X, give it a value, three. And then at some point I call the line X plus plus. The value of X will now be four. We just added one to X. It's really simple right? Um, X plus plus actually does two things, right? It's going to add one to the number and it's going to assign it back to the original, um, back to the original variable. So in this case, X. So it's the exact same thing as saying X equals X plus one, where you would calculate the value of the expression on the right, X plus one, whatever that is, and then reassign it back to X, right? Um, yeah. That's the, the way it goes, um, except that that's not exactly how it always works. And so we'll talk about that in a second. Before we do that, let's talk about its sort of brother operator, minus minus. Minus minus does exactly the same thing. It just subtracts one. So instead of adding one, we're going to take away one. X is three, X minus minus. Now X has the value of two. It's the exact same thing as saying X equals X minus one. So there's this little thing in computer science, uh, postfix and prefix. You can put this operator in either location, either x plus plus or plus plus x. Uh, some people prefer one or the other. I think I've used the x plus plus just because of the name C plus plus. So it's like the one that feels more natural to me. Um, but they actually do the same thing, exact same thing, but not exactly in the same order. And that's what makes them different. And by the way, I'm going to preface this by saying the reason I put post, postfix and prefix in here, it, A, you should see it and know it and, you know, whatever. But, like, this is a very popular interview question. I've had multiple students say they were applying for jobs and got this question. Um, something having to do with the difference between postfix and prefix. So, I figure it must be part of formal education. It must be something you should... You need to know it for job interviews, so uh, and also for general use. So postfix is when the plus plus is after the variable. Prefix is when the plus plus goes before the variable. Let's show a difference of what they do. Here I've got x is 3, just like before, and I'm going to see out x plus plus. Now this is interesting because I'm using x plus plus, um, but in an expression that is going to be used by the see out. Right? So we've got to do three things now, really. We've got to add one to x, reassign that value back to x, and then evaluate that expression so that we can send it to the C out. Right? So the way it works in postfix is that we are going to do the plus plus part after we express or figure out the evaluate the expression, right? So that means that we're going to evaluate the expression first and then add one to x afterwards, which means this is not going to print four to the screen. It's going to print three to the screen because we evaluated the expression first, right? The expression at this point is three. That's the value of x. And then after that gets sent to the C out, and then after that, we are going to add one to x and reassign that value back to x. So the plus plus part comes after which, by the way, 
total hint, it's post-fix. The plus plus is literally after the variable. So you will know, like just visually looking at it, you should evaluate the variable first for whatever you're using, whatever purposes you're using it for, and then when you're done, add the plus plus. If you wanted to print four to the screen here, you just flip it. Now this is prefix. This means I'm going to add one to X and reassign that value back to X, and then I'm going to evaluate the expression and the value of that variable for use in the C app. So this will actually print four to the screen because we added first, which obviously the plus plus part comes before the variable. So do the plus plus part first before you evaluate the variable. Like the hint is actually in the notation itself. Here's some, I guess, questions, right? Uh, if x is 3 and I say int y equals x plus plus, what's the value of y? This would be a very common quiz question and apparently a very common interview question, right? The value of y is 3 after these two lines of code. What's the value of x? 4. Why? Because we assigned the value of y while x was still 3. Then we added 1 to x, making x 4. So y is 3, x is 4. If we flip it, 3. I already gave you the answer. If we were to flip it and use prefix, now we know that, okay, the value of both x and y is going to be 4, right? We still add 1 to the x, but we added it before we assigned that value to y. This one's going to seem a little bit strange, but it still works the exact same way even when you're making a comparison, right? So x is 1, y is 1. These two values are equal. If x is equal, equal to y plus plus, well, we're going to add 1 to y, but we're going to add 1 after we evaluate the expression. So x is equal equal to y. Are these two things equal? Yes. So we're going to um, put the first one. We added after, right? Uh, versus using prefix, x is 1, y is 1, x equals equals plus plus y. We're going to add 1 to y before we evaluate the variable. So now these two things are not equal x is 1 uh, and y is 2. So not equal, we're going to print out added before, right? But again, just look at the location of the operator with the variable and that will tell you which thing to do first. And does it get more complicated? Yes, you can use a whole bunch of nested stuff, and but don't do that. That's confusing and people will not like you in the lunchroom. All right, so prefixes and postfix, again, uh, Kind of an odd corner, it's a small detail, but um, useful for job interviews, apparently. All right, so let's get into the meat of this week, loops. So there are lots of different types of loops in C++. They all basically do the same thing, and you can honestly write them in various ways to kind of get them to do the exact same thing regardless of the one you're using. It's just that sometimes it's easier to express something um, in a particular way. So when I show you an example for each of these loops, I'm gonna show you something that I think kind of represents a good time to use this loop. Um, but here's the thing, they all do the exact same thing because at the end of the day, if you look at the assembly language that's getting created by your C++ code, there's only one thing, I mean, it's got a couple variations, but like one thing, that's a jump, right? I'm gonna go from one line of code to another line of code. If, honestly, your if statements also just use jumps, right? If I jump over here, do something and then jump back, that's a branch, right? If I jump backwards and redo lines of code, that's a loop. And again, these loops will just kind of change the configuration of how the jump works with the other statements, um, which is all handled by the assembler and you don't have to worry about it, but at the end of the day, these all do the exact same thing. So we're gonna start with the first loop, the while loop. Uh, I have this sort of human readable version here. Uh, so while hungry, eat. Right, the idea here is that, hey, am I hungry? Yeah, I'm hungry, so I should eat. Let's, you know, have a bite. Oh, am I hungry? Yeah, I'm hungry, I should eat. I should continue doing this until I'm no longer hungry. Right? So the concept for the while loop is check a condition, am I hungry? While that condition is true, do something, take a bite, and then repeat. Ask the question, am I hungry? Yes, take a bite, repeat. You know, keep doing that. Um, here's the syntax for the while loop, um, and you'll notice that it has a condition. That condition are the same conditional expressions that we used in if statements, right? Branch statements. 
um, the exact same conditionals because again kind of the same thing loops and branches it just depends how the jump goes but don't worry about assembly code right now point being conditional uh, expressions exact same as for the ifs so we can just say while that condition is going to be evaluated to be either true or false if it's true then we're going to do the commands inside the block the curly braces uh, if it's not then we're going to skip the block and continue on with our program so here's an example um, and also an example of when you would want to use a while loop while loops are really good when i don't know the number of times to do something in other words if i know i have to do something a certain number of times there's a better loop for that while loops are great when I just don't know when something needs to stop. I don't know how many times it's going to happen because it's a real life sort of situation. So here I'm asking the user a question. Do you want to quit? Right? Well, I have no idea how many times you're going to say no. You might say no 10 times. You might say no, no times. You might immediately want to quit. You might say no, you know, a million times because you're super tenacious and have loads of time on your hand, I guess. But like, regardless, I don't know when you're going to stop. So I'll use a while loop. I'm just checking a condition. Hey, while this is true, keep doing it until it's not true. And then we'll stop. Um, this is obviously a very simple example that you could kind of code up at home or whatever. Uh, but like a really great example of this would be in like network communications. I'm going to send a message to a server. When am I going to get a response back? I don't know. Just keep checking until you get it. While loop, right? Um, and so, yeah, there's an example. Uh, by the way, you'll notice that I put a couple notes in these. So in my examples, every once in a while, you'll see a system pause line. That line is only needed if you're using Visual Studio. If you're using C Lion, um, you do not need to do it. If you're using Xcode, you do not need to do it. Uh, you'll probably actually get a little error saying, hey, I didn't recognize this, but it's kind of because they do recognize it and they just like, but we're not going to use it. Um, that's a Windows thing specifically. And the only reason you need to use it is if you're in Visual Studio, um, once your program gets to the end, uh, it immediately shuts down the window. And so then it's like you, you can't see what happened because it like runs and then immediately quits. Um, and so this is a way of saying, hey, before you quit, pause, which I think says, you know, press any key to continue or something. And then you can actually see the output of your program. Uh, the weird thing with Visual Studio, other things usually have a like a permanent um, place to put the output. So if you're not using Visual Studio, don't include that line. You don't need it. So here is a very, very similar loop, the do while loop. Do while loop, I'm going to use the exact same example because it's literally the same, right? Do eat while hungry. It's similar. But you notice the order is kind of off. And that's because this is a great example of like, um, let's say you're eating french fries. If there are french fries on the table, the chances of you not eating any french fries is pretty much zero, right? Like, I think we can all agree, you're gonna have a french fry. So what you do is, in this case, oh, there's french fries. First thing you're gonna do, have a french fry. Then after you eat the french fry, ask yourself, am I hungry? If yes, have another french fry. Ask yourself then, am I hungry? Then you're asking after you do it, right? So what does it mean? It just means that no matter what, you're gonna eat one french fry. It's like, that's, you haven't checked the conditional yet. You're gonna have one french fry, and then afterwards, you're going to ask yourself if you're hungry and repeat as needed, right? So do while loop concept, do something immediately. And then after you're done, check the condition. Am I actually hungry? Which is a great time to ask you, whatever, but like then repeat while that condition is true. So here's the syntax for the do while loop. You get do, which is sort of a floating do there. And then afterwards, the block of commands you want to do, you're going to immediately do those. And then while, now I will say that I often put the while connected to the, the last curly brace, like right below the commands. There's a couple different formatting things. Again, there's a style guide for most comp well, most big companies, and they'll tell you what they prefer so that your code sort of looks consistent across the company. Um, but you could do it either way. And then some people will drop the curly brace, the first curly brace down, so that the curly braces are on the same sort of column 
you know, there's one on top of the other. A couple different ways to format it, because white space doesn't matter in C++, but uh, the while loop can be there or the one above. I'm showing it here, there, the, another way in the example. So here's your example. When I think of uh, do while loops, I often think about um, input validation, right? The idea is that I want to ask you something. In this case, I'm asking you to enter a number between 1 and 10. Um, now, I don't use a CN here to get the number. I'm doing something a little different. It was an example I pulled from something else. So there's a couple new things here. I'll talk about them afterwards, but just trust me, that does the exact same thing as a CN. It's going to put a value into the temp variable, or sorry, into the number variable. So enter a number between 1 and 10. I get I type a number. It goes put it gets put into the number variable, and then I say while the number is less than one or number is greater than ten, uh, repeat. Right. So what's that mean? It means if you enter a number that isn't between one and ten, you add in negative six, you put in forty-two, whatever. It's going to ask you again. Enter a number between one and ten. You put in a false value. Enter a number between one and ten. Just going to keep repeating that so long as you give it a bad value. Now you should probably also put in a little message or something, but like what it's doing the same thing. All right. Um, so input validation, I often think of do while loops uh, just because you're going to ask the first time. And if they give you a valid answer the first time, you're not going to repeat. But if they don't, then you're going to repeat. Right. Um, so now the code that you see up here, you may decide to use it, may not. Um, I'm just throwing this out as, a, as an alternative to CN. We're using a few things that are a little bit early. We don't need to, but the get line command. Now, you're going to have to include the string library, I believe, to use the get line command. But <clears throat> there's actually a different version that's like cn.getline, but this is the version I use. And so what get line does is it takes from somewhere and it puts into somewhere a string. So I am going to evaluate that C out you know, sorry, the C out is just the prompt, but enter a number between one and 10, but like from, I'm going from the CN, so it's coming from the, the console in, the keyboard, and I'm putting it into a variable called temp. I need a string temp for this to work, right? But I'm interpreting it as a string, which means that I'm not gonna get that error if I use CN and I try to put it into like an integer variable and you type like F-I-V-E or something, right? If you type in F-I-V-E, it doesn't know that that's actually five, and it's going to, you know, crash. Well, getLine's not going to crash because it's wanting a string. It's just grabbing the characters. Then I use S2I, which is a conversion. It stands for string to integer, and it will convert that string into an integer, right? Um, and so that value temp, right, my temporary string, I'm going to interpret that now and try to make it into an integer. Now, by the way, that can crash, right? There's a way to solve that using a try block um, and what we call exception handling, which we're not going to talk about today. But I'm just saying that eventually this ends up being the safer way to get input from the user. Because if they type in F-I-V-E, you're going to be able to get that in Try to use S2I to interpret, and if not, be able to catch an exception to solve the problem. But for right now, we're not going to bother catching the exceptions. We're going to make sure it works, which means you could also use CN. Uh, but that S2I, I'm going to assign that value into number, and so now number is an integer that will have the value that you typed in. It's just less likely to crash. This actually also solves another problem, which is kind of hidden. And if you just use CN, you'll run into it at some point, and it's going to frustrate the heck out of you. CN, for numbers, grabs the number part, but you, when you type in a number, right, there's this input buffer, and you're putting characters into the input buffer that are then getting read by the CN, right, that stream buffer. So CN will grab the number part, but it leaves that new line character, because you actually typed 5 enter right? You put a new line character into the input buffer, and that is going to be a problem later. Well, it's not going to be a problem if you only ever use CN for numbers in your program, because it'll always just grab the number part and leave that new line. Grab the number part, leave that new line. Um, for the life of me, there is a reason for that. There's a reason CN does that with numbers, and it has to do with the way we inputted things on consoles, and I cannot remember it, right? But it is annoying. No modern language does it that way. 
It's just a remnant of the past, but it's one you got to live with. So the problem is if you're only doing numbers, you're fine. But the second you ask for a string, well, you've got all these new lines on the input buffer. So you've already entered a string. It was new line, which is nothing. And then it's going to continue on with the program. And suddenly you're going to be like, wait, why did it skip that part? I asked it, I did CN, I wanted it to do a string. But there's a couple different ways you can get around this. You can do a cn.sync or whatever. But this is my preferred way only because later on, uh, when you're asking for numbers from, or any sort of input, if you want a string, by the way, you just get rid of the S2I line, right? You just use get line to get the string. Your job's done. Bob's your uncle. But uh, if you, you know, later on, we can use exceptions to make this a little bit safer. Point being, I like this method, but you don't have to use it for right now. You can just use CN, especially if you're just dealing with numbers. Also perfectly acceptable. All right. Anyway, that's your do while loop. Do something and then check to see if you should do it again. The for loop. The for loop is easy. Drop and give me 20. This is when I know the number of times I want to do something. And so the for loop looks a little bit more complicated. It sounds a little bit more complicated, but once you get used to it, it actually ends up being the easier way to do something, right? If you try to do what a for loop does with a while loop, you end up writing just as much code, but it takes up more lines and it's not all nicely put into like a header. Um, but the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a counter, right? This counter is going to count how many times I've done something. So I have to initialize that counter to a, to a value of some sort, uh, usually zero, but you know, that's because of arrays and the way they're indexed. And we haven't talked about arrays yet, so you don't know what, what's going on yet. But like eventually you're probably gonna always start at zero. So initialize a counter, then check a condition. If it's true, do something. Then you're going to modify the counter and repeat from step two. You never go back to initialize the counter because that wouldn't make any sense, right? The count the whole point of the counter is that I want to keep track of something. Although I could actually modify it in other ways, the vast majority of the time when I want to modify the counter, I'm just going to use that plus plus operator to add one to it. Because that's, if you think about a counter, you, the first time it's zero, the next time it's one, the next time it's two, the next time it's three, right? I'm wanting to add one each time. We'll get into it. So the way it does, it works here, four, and then there's three different things separated by semicolons. And yes, annoyingly, the modify doesn't have a semicolon after it. Why? It's just the way it gets parsed. They just put semicolons between the three different expressions. I, I'm not Bjorn Straustrup. You know what? And he's a lot smarter than me, so there's probably a really great reason for there not being a semicolon after the modify, but aesthetically, this doesn't look like the other code that we write, and I don't like that. So, but hey, that's not up to me, right? Initialize, semicolon. Condition, semicolon, modify. So we're gonna hit the green part first, then check the condition, orange. If it's true, we do the commands. When we go back up into the loop, we're not gonna hit the initialize, we're gonna hit the modify. Do whatever that says to do, and then check the condition again. Let me show you a real world example. Hopefully that'll make more sense. So here I'm asking you, how high do you want me to count? I take that just using a standard CN into X. So now I have X, let's say you typed five, right? I want you to count to five. So uh, INT I equals zero. We're going to start with zero because everything in computer science starts with zero. It's just, it, when you count, just start with zero. I don't know. You, you could start with one if you wanted to. Uh, you, just, you would initialize your counter by saying int I equals one as opposed to int I equals zero. But I'm going to choose zero. Int I equals zero. Then I'm going to check my condition. My condition is I less than or equal to X. Okay, so is zero less than five? Because assuming I put five in for X. Yes, that's true. Okay, so then I'm gonna see out I, which is zero, onto the screen, end line, and now I'm at the bottom of the loop. So I'm gonna go back up to the top of the loop, but I'm not gonna to go to the end I equals zero part. That's the initialize. I'm gonna to go to the modify part, the part at the end, I plus plus. That's gonna add one to I. So now I is one. Then I go to the middle part, the condition. Is one less than or equal to five? Yes, so then I print out one. Then I print out two, then I print out three, then I print out four, and then I print out five, and then I go back up to the top and I say I plus plus, I is now six, my counter is now at six, um, I less than or equal to 
five. So is six less than or equal to five? Nope, it's not. So then I exit the loop and hit the return zero, right? Basically, I'm just doing it the number of times that I want. This is gonna print out the numbers between zero and five, which actually means that I did six things, which is why you often don't use less than or equal to, you just use less than because then I'm gonna do five things, but I'm not actually gonna go up to five, I'm gonna go zero to four. But that only makes sense for arrays, and I asked you how high you wanted me to count, so I actually do have to hit that last number, I'll do less than or equal to. But just know you don't always wanna do less than or equal to, usually less than, but later on we'll talk about that. Point being, this is my counter. Now, by the way, I called my counter I. Why did I call my counter I? I generally stands for iteration, which is a fancy computer science term. Actually, I think it's just a fancy English term, but it just means something that you do like over and over and over again. Each time you do it would be considered an iteration, right? And so uh, this process that we're using to solve this problem would be called an iterative process. It's something that you do over and over and over again, right? Um, later on, we may talk about something called recursion, but iterative solutions, recursion, it, the I stands for iteration um, because this is an iterative solution we're using a loop. Uh, anyway, this is a for loop, really helpful when you actually know how often you want to do something. And by the way, that is a lot. Like, if I know that there's this many things in the collection, I can go through, you know, that many things and then check each one and, you know, like, you often will know how many times you want to do something or at least be able to calculate it. And so then a for loop is the right choice or a choice. You can actually use a while loop too. There's a way to write a while loop. You just actually have to create a counter yourself, initialize it before the while loop, have put the condition in the normal place where you put the condition for a for or for a while loop, but you know, the one from the for loop, and then just make sure that somewhere in the loop you increment the counter. So you do the I plus plus maybe at the bottom of the block of code done the exact same way, it's just, because again, it all just jumps. So, a couple modifying things you can do as you're going through a loop. Um, you don't have to, in fact, some people say that these are bad, you shouldn't use them. Uh, if you were smarter, you would have written your conditional in such a way that it, and I get that, and that's probably true for a lot of stuff that you're doing in class, um, but I don't know, in the real world, every once in a while, I just it's easier to put a break. Like I just, I have an exception. Like, hey, if you ever see this, stop, right? You know. So, anyway, um, yeah, break. It stops the iteration of the loop. Gets you out of the loop. Why would you want to do it? Well, you put it, I don't know, some conditional on it, and so then, if you happen to see this condition, get out of here, right? You know, if you happen to get this result from the server, stop the connection. If you happen to, you know, whatever, you break. So here, you could potentially put that just in the, the while, right? Um, like, I only want to go up to six, so I'm just gonna say while i is less than six. This example isn't the best, but it, at least the output will show very clearly what these two things do. So here I've got basically a while loop set up to look like a for loop, right? I initialize my counter, because we were just we just talked about how you can do this either way. So initialize the counter and i equals zero. Then I had my while loop. My condition for the while loop is inside the conditional part. So, so long as i is less than 12. And then I have a block of code that will get repeated. Inside that block of code, right, at some point I print out i and then do i plus plus, right? I have to modify the counter so that I can go back up and check the conditional again. Standard while loop, but kind of doing the job that you would normally do with a for loop. Um, but before I print it out, I ask this question, if i is equal to six, break. So how many times do I actually execute the loop? Well, I'm gonna go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, but when I get to six, right before I print it out, I break. And then I say, the current value of i is six, right? That's exactly what it does, zero through five, and it says the current value of i is six. We stop the loop at six. Um, now, why would you want to do it this way? Again, this is a, a silly example. You could just do i less than six, right? But at the very least, in the real world, sometimes there are people who, they're math types, I think, and they teach computer science, and they are interested in the purity of the language. Um, and then there's sort of the more engineering types, and it's just like, okay, does it work consistently? Like, is it reliable? You know, does it get the job done? Does it work? 
Um, and I'm just like, when you're sort of in a real world situation, sometimes it's like, yeah, I could like do this like really weird kind of funky thing over here, but like, you know, what? I just, if there's an exception, I want to break. Now though, another modifying word is continue. This keyword is probably less controversial because it does something different than break, right? This isn't quite the same thing. Like you'd have to write a really funky conditional in order to get this to, no, because the conditional for the loop is going to exit everything. Continue, you don't want to exit everything. It does almost the exact same thing, except that instead of getting to the, like, let's break out of the loop permanently and then start our next line of code, instead it's going to uh, go back up to the top and just check the condition again, right? So instead of, in this example, by the way, this is the exact same example, except that I switched the word break with continue so you could see the difference between what those two things do. Here, initialize a counter to i. So long as i is less than 12, we're going to do something. If i is equal to 6, continue. Otherwise, print out i, increment i, right? So when I get up to i is equal to 6, I, that condition is going to be true. Right before I print it, I'm going to hit continue. But instead of exiting out the bottom of the loop, I'm going to go back up to the top and check the conditional again, right? Is 6 less than, or is, uh, ooh, I realize I just changed something, but this code is actually, I think, going to lead to an infinite loop, isn't it? Sorry. I had written this differently earlier, and I was like, why did I do that? That looks dumb. And then I fixed it, and I actually broke it. That's why I wrote it the other way. I put the I++ before the if before. Hi. So this is going to actually, don't, don't type this one in. But in general, if I were to put the I++ before the continue, like I should have, and did, and then forgot why I did it, and now suddenly remembered it, hi, even if you've been doing this a long time, it's still really easy to make a dumb mistake because you think you know something, and you think it's easy, and you totally just miff it. Even ice skaters trip over their own feet every once in a while, even if they're Olympic level. So here's the thing, don't, don't type this in, but um, what this is going to do, right, when I is get to six, if I had done it beforehand, it's gonna just skip that one version right, because it's gonna go back up and check the conditional again. So what this would have done had I put the I++ before the if like I did before, is that uh, it would print out all of the values and then say the current value gets to 12. It actually gets all the way to the end of the loop. But you'll notice there's a number missing, six. There's no six it's because when I hit six, right before I printed it out, I escaped and went back up to the top and checked the conditional again. Uh, which would have been fine, but anyway, that's fine. Uh, I'm not going to re-record this. So uh, yeah, 0 through 12, we're going to skip the 6 and uh, current value of 12. Continue is really great when you want to skip just one iteration of something, right? Like in these particular, or even maybe several iterations, right? But whenever you see this is true, skip it. On every other case, do some work, right? Um, Sometimes, and this is a terrible analogy, but I sort of use like, like in dating, right? A continue is sort of like a yellow flag. It's like, oh, you know what? Let's, let's stop what we're doing right now. But you know what? I might answer your call again later. Um, whereas break is a red flag. You are not answering this person's call ever again. You've broken out of the loop, all right? Weird analogy, but helps people remember sometimes. Uh, so strategies. Uh, when it comes down to loops and honestly with branches, because you're going to use these in combination a lot, um, figure out what you need to do first. Don't worry about the syntax. Think about the problem itself um, and be organized. In general, think about what you need to do before the repetitive task to set up for it. Uh, what exactly do you need to repeat? That should only be what's in the, the block. You don't want to do extra things there, especially if this code is going to get run over like millions of records in a database. Extra work inside the loop is performance lost, right? Um, and then what should you do after the repetitive task, right? So clean up, doing whatever, you know, what doesn't necessarily need to belong in there? Um, there's some things that are kind of weird. So like, I would never declare a variable inside a loop. I always declare the variable before the loop and then just modify the variable inside the loop. However, if you actually do declare the variable inside the loop, most IDEs, well, I should say most compilers, are going to fix that for you, right? They're gonna pull it out and do it right. But that's like depending on your airbags. Like 
don't do it in the first place. You're not actually wanting to declare the variable multiple times. You only want to declare the variable once. You want to add one to it multiple times. If you don't do it quite right, the computer fixes it for you, but like, or it may, or there may be some compilers that don't do that. Um, but you know, in general, yeah, it's, you decide what's right and say what you want and make sure you get it right. Like don't, don't depend on others. You know, it's like, it's like those cars that have the, uh, the automatic braking systems. It's not like you're going to go up to every red light and just gas it the entire way and depend on that system every time. You know, it's like, no, I, I know to brake. Brake when you want to brake. Um, the other thing is you'll notice with all of these examples, um, here I've got a while loop and I've got an if inside and you notice that everything that's inside of that loop is indented one level, right? So that it's all lined up. I can clearly see just by looking at this code what is inside the loop and what is outside the loop, right? Because of where it's indented. C++ does not care about that, right? If you don't indent, if you put curly braces all over the place and yada yada, so long as you have the right number and they're in the right spots, um, C++ will not care. Your coworkers will kill you, right? Like that's not clean. That doesn't look good, um, and it's hard to read. And hard to read code is, well, almost as bad as uncommented code. But whatever, it, you get the idea, right? And then notice the if, the thing inside the if is indented a second level. So now I know what's inside the if and what's just inside the loop. The more organization you can have, like the better. Uh, it's going to make things much easier, uh, especially when you start doing something crazy, like nested loops, loops gone wild. We are just going to do loops inside of loops, uh, the turducken of computer science. So here's the thing. What if you take a loop and you put it inside another loop, right? You think, well, why did you want it to be, like, that's just why. Don't do that. But that's actually a lot of times where you want to do that. In fact, sometimes you have to do that. Uh, we'll talk about two-dimensional arrays later. But, like, just trust me. Sometimes you need to do it. So the idea here is that for every, sorry, for each iteration of the outside loop, I'm going to do every iteration of the inside loop. And then I'm going to do another iteration of the outside loop, which will cause me to do every iteration of the inside loop. Let's look at an example. Here I've got, uh, I used cantaloupe and ice because, you know, in the actual classroom, if I use red, it doesn't show up against the black. Projectors aren't good enough. Point being here, I've got my outside loop that's kind of this cantaloupe color. Um, and it just counts the characters zero to four, right? The first half of the single digit characters. And it's going to do it, you know, Something, well, it's going to do it five times because I go less than or equal to four, right? So it's going to be zero, one, two, three, four. Then inside of that, I have another loop. That loop, it uses J for a counter because that is really, really common in computer science textbooks. And I don't know why exactly. I assume they use J because it looks like the I, but that seems like a bad reason to use J. I would use a different letter that doesn't look like I if I were in charge of writing a textbook, but I'm not. So... They know what they're doing. I's and J's look really similar. Let's use the two of them in really close proximity so that somebody with, you know, their contacts acting a little wonky someday is going to screw stuff up, but whatever. Outside loop I, inside loop uses J for a counter, and it's going to iterate between the characters five and nine, right? Five, six, seven, eight, nine. So five characters, but the other five. Then inside that loop, we're going to print I and J. So the two characters together the outside loop character and the inside loop character, and then we're gonna tab. So for every iteration of the outside loop, i is zero, I'm gonna do every iteration of the inside loop. j is five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then we're gonna exit the inside loop, which here is going to do a couple inlines and then go back out to the outside loop, i is one. And I is one, we're gonna do all the iterations of the inside loop. J is five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? Couple inlines, I is two. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Couple inlines, you know, I is three. Five, six, you get the drift. What's the output of this gonna look like? It's gonna look like this. Nested loops are really, really, uh, at least heavily in my mind, associated with tabular data. And here you can sort of see the outside loop you know, it's printing zeros the first time, right? 
Well, the inside loop does every iteration of the inside loop, so 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So, but for the first time, all of those are 0. The second time, all of them are 1. The next time, all of them are 2, which means that the outside loop, you can kind of see it as controlling the row. Right? There's row 0, row 1, row 2, row 3, row 4. Whereas the inside loop, you can kind of see it creating the columns. The first thing I do in every loop is 5. The second thing I do in every loop is 6. The next thing I do in every loop is 7. Right? The inside loop sort of controlling the columns, the outside loop kind of controlling the, the rows. Um, again, I associate nested loops with tabular data, two-dimensional arrays, which you don't know about yet, but it's coming on it's pretty soon. Uh, and uh, yeah, so they're nested, they're needed. They're nested, they're needed. They're needed, they're nested. They look crazy. And by the way, indentation will set you free. There is nothing worse than badly indented nested loops. By the way, can I put a nested loop inside of a nested loop inside of a nested loop? Yeah, you can. But we're not going to do it today. And there's great reasons, I'm sure, why you would need to. But, you know, you don't need to as much as well. Point being, last thing. Infinite loops. Infinite loops are always a bad thing, right? Well, not always. I mean, so here's the thing. Sometimes you want to do an infinite loop. Sometimes it's just easier to do an infinite loop. Um, and, and then have your conditional somewhere inside. For most of your projects, this is not going to be something you need. Um, but an example of an infinite loop. Um, when you have a smartphone, right? You turn on your smartphone and nothing happens. But that's not true. Right? There is something happening. It's called a run loop. That run loop is constantly going through all the different things you could, all the different ways you could possibly interact with the phone, and it's listening for you, listening for you to do something. And then you touch the phone somewhere, and it's like, oh, that snagged one. You touched on you know this location, so I'm going to send you know this. I'm going to make this particular function call to the thing what actually happens, you get to decide, right? Like that's that's your, your handler. But it's listening constantly and just running through this loop infinitely. Now, if I were to actually look at the code for, you know, like the operating system for iPhone, it may not actually be an infinite loop. There may actually be a conditional there. It just kind of feels like an infinite loop. But if it is, I don't know what that conditional is. And it's effectively making an infinite loop. It's just constantly running. And it's got a whole bunch of exits, but all those exits are inside the loop as a response to some sort of interaction. Um, and there may actually be another one that just ends everything, but I haven't seen their code. Point being, if you ever need to write an infinite loop, for whiles and do whiles, it's easy. The, the one expression that will always return true, like will always come back true, is true. So while true, repeated code, that's going to go forever. Do something while true, it's going to go forever. Uh, for fours, it's a little weird. You just do the semicolons and don't put any of the three things in between them. Forever, right? Um, so yeah, if you ever want an infinite loop to create something like a run loop, uh, you can use that. And that is it for loops. So hopefully that'll help you with your assignment this week. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, send me a message in Canvas. I will see you online.